All right. So thank you so much for joining us. For those of you here or those watching the stream after this has been recorded, we will be talking tonight and Ben will be leading us through some experimentation with Next.js and learning a little bit about what that means for uh, server-side rendering and static site generation and lots of fun things. Thank you for being here. Ben, an intro? Yeah, uh, yeah. my name is Ben. For those who don't know me, I'm on the Vue core team and recently joined the Nux Ambassadors program. So uh, happy to be here to do all the Vue Nux open source things. And uh, yeah, currently a staff developer experience engineer at Netlify. And uh, yeah, so I guess I'll introduce Tracy, who couldn't be here tonight, but she's also one of the organizers here. And she's at Bloomberg Industry Group, and she's absolutely stellar. We also have another organizer, Chris Guerreri. He's at Politico. He is a lead front end engineer there and is fantastic. He's done a number of presentations with us just over the past few months. And I'm Jack. I am a software engineer at Compass. I had been at Politico, which was my first exposure to Vue. Right now I'm doing mostly Go development, but very happy to be here and excited to learn a little bit about Next. Our standard update slide, because we're very proud of these stats, I grabbed the number just before this. We're up to 1,048 members. So thank you everyone nice. for sticking with us. It is trending. That That's a trending up. I think we had one month when it trended down to one person, <laughs> but so far it's been a uh, pretty trend positive. We had a first meetup in 2017. And since then, every month, with maybe the exception of one recently, we've had yeah. a, a meetup per month, which has been pretty great. For now, we're sticking with remote, but we'll keep an eye on when in-person makes sense as office spaces become available and people feel comfortable about that. If you feel strongly about wanting to do in-person events, feel free to message us, let us know how you feel about it. We'll just keep, keep a gauge on how people are yeah. as we start to consider this. Uh, and then here are some links. I'll grab these and I'll throw them in the chat as, as Ben gets started. But yeah, we have a website, we have a Discord. Discord is great because Ben's available there and is able to give a lot of excellent help with you. And we have a fairly engaged community there. Cool. And maybe the last thing to highlight before we pass it over to Ben is that we're always looking for talks. I'll grab these links as well. So we always want to mention that if you have anything with Vue that you've worked on recently, that you worked on a long time ago too, we'd love to hear from you. We generally have at least two main styles of talks. One, like you'll hear from Ben or, or that you'll hear from some of our presenters is longer, like in-depth dive into something that utilizes Vue or a project that utilizes Vue or a framework like tonight. But we also love lightning talks where you just want to quickly summarize, hey, I worked on this thing or I learned this thing anywhere, five, 15 minutes, whatever you're feeling. And we'd love to work with you on any talk ideas. Great way to practice presenting, practice public speaking. And then a great one that both Ben and I liked is it's great practice for presenting at conferences, especially fun Absolutely. conferences that are start to, starting to be in person again. <laughs> cool. With that, I think I will pass it over to Ben. We're going to be talking tonight about experimenting with Next.js. I will be, I'll be dropping off in a bit here, but I want to pass it over to our experts, our very much our resident expert. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate it. Tonight, I know we have a bit of a smaller group. So Bill, Kobe, Isaac, if you all are comfortable and you want to call it, join the call or just simply be allowed to chat via voice, I guess just give me like a thumbs up in the chat. And then I'd love this to be as interactive as humanly possible because the goal here for us is to walk through Nux from like a Especially because with the three of you here, I would love to hear your all thoughts and then we can always tailor it to what's going on. So Kobe, cool guy throwing you on. You don't have to turn on video. You can just stick with the voice if you want. So with that, I guess let's, let's start the conversation off. So who here, like what does Nux mean to you all, right? When you hear Nux, has anyone here worked with it? This is Kobe. So we're pretty, uh, pretty, pretty familiar with Gridsum, which is a different kind of version of Nux in a way, but I was an early adopter of that. I've helped with some of that early on, but they seem, whether it's COVID or just regular life, they seem to slow down in their development mm -hmm. on that. And I really like, obviously as you being Netlify, really <laughs> aligns to that Jamstack stuff. So I really want to keep going along with it. And Nux really seems to hit that sweet spot of really doing the single page applications, server side rendering, and then the, the server rendered or static version. So I, I yep. really want to learn more about that since I just haven't really had the time to, to delve into that. So fantastic. I say, Bill, Isaac, do y'all have any thoughts as far as what, what, ning, uh, what Nux means for you? What Nux means to you? I swear I can talk. Don't worry. We'll be like this for the rest of the evening. All right. I think 
I'll leave it there. But Kobe, you, you, so you bring up an excellent point, right? Which is that since Nux is kind of this meta framework on view, there are different static site generators. And similar to you, I actually did use Gridsum kind of earlier on. And for those who don't know, in fact, you know what? I might as well just start starting sharing screen at this point. All right, so let me bring over a window here. And so Gridsum. So for those who don't know, this is a static site generator that was basically modeled after Gatsby. So mm-hmm. very much the like taking your content and giving you like your own GraphQL endpoints and having everything assembled from there. So to Kobe's point, it does seem like they've been in basically, they haven't ever gotten to like V1 I and mean, it's been some time. So I understand the reservation as far as continuing to invest. Again, I'd love to see still more options for people when it comes to static site generation and um, different versions of APIs. But when it comes to this kind of stuff, Nux definitely does seem to be leading the charge, especially within the Vue community. And if I were to sum up next or <laughs> Nux in one statement, uh, it would basically be a meta framework built on Vue to make a lot of the things that we're used to doing ourselves as far as configuring routes, store management, and all that stuff. <clears throat> it does that automatically for us. And then on top of that, what it does is it extends on functionality that we eventually end up having to reach for as far as whether it's defining meta tags, making sure that we can actually generate the pages um, in a server-side rendered way. There are a lot of things that Nux does for us that is really nice out of the box. And so what we're gonna do today here is, let me bring in the chat. Hey, how's it going, Aiden? So what we're gonna do today here is go through Nux from the ground up. We're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and build an app together and do it live. And this way you can have questions as we go through and basically get a familiarity with Nux. And so to start, I'd love to hear from, or suggestions, call it out. This is a true, there are no plants in this audience, I promise. What do you all want to see me build tonight? Let's see. Any suggestions? I have an idea if you want, but I just figure it might be fun if someone has a specific theme in mind. Okay. All right. Maybe, okay. Something that gets data from an API bill. Okay. You know what? In that case, we're going to use, let's see, what's a good free API. Is there a free API that people enjoy using? I usually default to the Pokemon one, but since I did that last month, I I probably want to do different ones. Super base real time. That'll take some authentication that I think might detract from the next part of it. Okay. uh, Okay. Here we go. Earthquake data from USGS. Ooh, this is, this'll be fun. Okay. Let's see. Is there, where's the API for this? Do-do-do. Earthquake data from UPS, USGS. Here we go. Here's the API. API documentation. So can we just get a sample one that I can pull? Let's try this one. See what happens. Okay. <clears throat> Great. So here we have application waddle catalogs, maybe here. Okay. This is great. So we can render all these things. I'm trying to see, is there a specific locator? Okay. So we'll hang on to this. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Bill. So we have here, here's this JSON standard. So Bill, since you seem to be you're a little bit familiar with this, can you get me a URL for one of these JSON collections that I can request later on with Nux? And then that'll <clears throat> basically set us up to go. All right. So let's go ahead and kick it off with Nux and just get it started. So as far as getting a basic Nux product project up and running, we're just going to run the Yarn Create Nux app CLI. So basically this is, for those not familiar with this, you usually have to install like a CLI package in order to install anything. So that's why we have you install Vue CLI, for example, so that you can scaffold the Vue app. Well, a sort of recent update to like the NPM Yarn workspace bit is that they allow you to then create apps based on a starter template so that it removes that step of needing the CLI. So that way it basically downloads the dependencies to set everything up. And then at the end of it, it deletes itself. Whereas with a lot of CLI tooling, I'm sure you install it globally, maybe use it once or twice, and then it's gone. Um, And then you like never touch it again. So that's a waste of space. So this was like an evolution on that idea. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go into my project folder and I'm going to do yarn create Nuxt app. And we're going to call this the earthquake, or I'm going to call this Nuxt earthquake demo. 
And so what you see here is exactly as I mentioned, it's going in to download all the dependencies that we need to create this Nuxt app scaffold. So it's going to bring me through some prompts here. Let me go ahead and bump this up a little bit larger so people can see. And so we, okay, Nuxt earthquake demo. We're going to just do it in JavaScript. I prefer Yarn. Don't worry about the UI framework. And we're going to skip all this. We're not even going to worry about Axios and this kind of stuff. I'll turn on ESLint and actually, you know, I'm not going to turn on any linting tools because that's something that can get in the way. And then otherwise we want to make sure it's universal because what we want to do, one of the things that Nux does really well for us is leverage the view thinking, but then bringing us into more static generation so that we can deliver pages to users that aren't so laden with JavaScript uh, right up front. So we're going to do um, static Jamstack hosting. I think this is what actually most people are going to want when it comes to generating their sites. And let me turn on the JSON convict just because I'm using VS code. And then, yep, Ben Hong, I use Git, and then it's going to set up. Okay, so as far as for those who aren't as familiar, what is static site generation? So typically when we do just a view CLI app and we configure router, everything is typically done with that slash hashtag and then the route. But what it's ultimately doing on the back end is that when a user is requesting a page, it will request index.html for every single page and then JavaScript does the magic. And for those of us who have deployed enough sites to production, we know that this isn't exactly the best practice anymore, or not that it ever really was the best practice, but it's frowned upon because what you're ultimately doing is you're not, you're sending way too much JavaScript up front to users. And what you want to do is send just what the user needs and then use JavaScript to sprinkle it on top. And so Nux does a really good job letting us use that kind of component architecture that we're used to with Vue.js while still leveraging the ability of like static site generation, which we'll see. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the Nux Earthquake demo. And let's take a look at what's going on in here. So bump this up a little bit as well. And so you'll notice a couple of things here. It's going to look, it looks a little bit different than what we're used to from like, a, we usually expect like a source a folder that contains components and like an app.view. But you notice here that we have this kind of different directory. So before getting started, let's go ahead and just run the local dev server to see what exactly is happening. So I'm going to bump this over to two thirds and I'll bump this over to one third and let's open this up at localhost 3000. And we'll see here now, I'm going to hide the terminal here. And then when we look at the index.view page, you'll see here that when I, I'm just, I'm just going to switch this out real quick and say, hello, view DC, July, 2021 and save it. This should look pretty darn familiar. We are all quite familiar when it comes to single file components. So we have here our template and our script. So what is different about this? You might've noticed that actually when I queued up this, this is normally you might look at app.view to start it off. But what we have here is actually this pages folder. And the beautiful part about the pages folder is what you get is file-based directory like routing. And so what do I mean by that? So if I go ahead and let's add another file, let's do about.view, right? Because I want to create an about page. So about.view, I'm going to go ahead and do my single file component. And this time I'm going to say about page and to save, you see that I have my index page and my about page. And this time when I go to slash about, you'll see that about appears exactly as you would expect. And so you're like, okay, so does this work when we nest with directories? It sure does. So right now if I clear a folder and let's call them, this one, we're going to just call them earthquakes. And inside of earthquakes, we're going to have a special dot view, for example. And so in here, I'm just going to write special, uh, special earthquake, right? Let me zoom out a little bit so you can see. And so what we get here now is all of a sudden, if I go to earthquakes slash special, you'll see that it actually has generated all that routes for us already, which is one of, in my opinion, one of the best developer experiences that can be laid atop like what we typically do when it comes to view like application generation. Because otherwise you'd have to what? You'd have to create the page. You'd have to go into view router config. You'd have to define that route, make sure you point it to the right component. All of this is done out of the gate. And so we were talking earlier about building and generating, right? Like why is this? Okay, so this is some nice DX, but what is the output at the end? So right now, if I go ahead and instead run yarn generate, basically telling Nux, I wanna go ahead and take my site and build something with it. We're gonna see something interesting here. I'm gonna go ahead and let it go through, process everything. And so you see there, it's generating a bunch of routes. 
And inside of the disk folder that we see, we actually see now the actual index.html page here. You'll see that it's generated all this stuff, right? The, the HTML has already actually been uh, hydrated inside of the HTML so that it's not being populated by JavaScript. So if someone has JavaScript disabled, they are going to get the homepage exactly as you would expect. The about page has been given its about index.html right here. So you can see down here, once again, I don't even need any JavaScript. I can see that my H1 exists right here. And so this right here hopefully starts to bring, the, bring to light what Nux makes possible now. That with just a simple bit of abstraction, we've gotten much more capable at moving things around in a way that makes sense on a multi-page site. And so now what I wanna go ahead and do is let's go ahead and we're gonna build out this earthquake demo. So it looks like Bill has an example, let's see. So I'm gonna take the month data right here. All right. So with this month data, let's see how this works. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into my index.view page and let's build this as if we were thinking about this from a, a standard view CLI approach. And what would we probably do? We'd probably say that, well, when the app is created, we probably want to run a fetch on this JSON here. So I'm going to say const, let's see, API URL is going to be equal to this path that we have here. And we're going to want to fetch from it and then update our app. So let me go ahead and create a data property for us to track. And we'll call this earthquake data. And I'm going to assume that it's going to come back as an array. Although I just realized I could just check that really quick. Nope, comes back as an object. So I'm going to go ahead and set this as an empty object instead. And so inside of here, what we're going to do now is we'll utilize the fetch API from the browser. So this is just basically consider your Axios. And I'm going to use the await uh, async await syntax to make it a little bit easier. So you'll see that I'll await fetch the, actually let me hide the sidebar, API URL right here. And so once we fetch this here, what we're going to want to do is then say, this, oh, I think I might be a little early on doing this, but let's do this dot earth data, um, earthquake data equals response. And to make sure that we can show this, let me go ahead and wrap this in a div because we're not in view three anymore. So I'm going to wrap this with the div so they have our single root and I'm going to print out our earthquake data. All right. Oh, I forgot. I didn't start the local dev server. That would help. Let's go ahead and let that run. And so as you all have questions, seriously, just go ahead and raise your hand in the chat. As you can see, I have Kobe here. So if you want to, you know, be here on voice and just interrupt whenever, I'm more than happy to have you on. We have a small group here so can totally facilitate that. Okay. So what's going on here right now? Let's see. So if we take a look at the network and refresh, we'll see here that right now the fetch is da, 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 wrong page. Ha, there you go. Kobe with the clutch win. That's right. I am on earthquake right now. So let's go back to home and here we go. Now we have something coming up. We'll see here that we fetched the API URL. This is good and we've set it. So to show you that this actually worked, when we go inside our view dev tools and then you'll notice here that inside of our pages next, we do actually have a response inside of here. Now, what we do need to do is actually, I believe, JSONify this. So let's go ahead and do that. Then take the data and data.json. And I think this should fix our problem much better. Okay. So what we see here now is that everything basically is pretty standard in terms of what you would expect from building a view app. The main difference here, though, is that now, okay, so now we have this feature collection. And so what we probably want to do here is we have, let's see, type metadata features. Okay. Um, try to remember what's the best way to explore this. Actually, I do have it in here. Let's see, so we here, I wanna try to do a pretty list of this stuff. So here we have, okay, here we go. We have our earthquake data object. We have features here, which has a lot of different things. And then it has the ID with, is there anything more can I do with it? All right, I'm just gonna do the ID. We're just gonna list out the IDs. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna do a list of, each quake is in a feature. Okay, perfect, Bill, appreciate it. 
So what I'll do here is I'll do, so I'll do earthquake here. And then inside of here, we'll do a list where we're going to loop through our earthquake data. And more specifically, we want the features. So I'm going to actually loop through features to be more specific. And for every earthquake in this, we're going to go ahead and assign this the earthquake ID as the key so that we don't, we make sure everything's working performantly. And then I'm just going to print out the earthquake ID here. So if we save this, you'll see now that we have this giant list of earthquakes, which is great. And so you're like, okay, this is a good start. We have this thing up and running. Now, what happens at this point? So you're like, okay, my site is good to go. Let's go ahead and deploy this. So what I'm gonna do actually real quick is let's go ahead and commit this data so that later on I can, we can share this with you all. So I'll say feature Nux app with basic earthquake data. Okay. So now that we have this, the question is what happens when we build it? So I'm gonna run the same command this time as yarn generate. And so since we're building for the Jamstack, what we want to do ideally is that when we're building the site, especially for something that let's say like earthquake data is probably not changing as frequently, we probably don't want the user actually doing a full fetch every single time. Like maybe eventually we want to extend on this, but basically we could probably afford to statically generate most of it at build time. And if anything to layer on top of it for performance, we can say, when the user loads this page, like if the data is out, like we could track it somewhere and say, okay, if it's outdated, then refresh the whole thing. Otherwise there's no point, uh, there's no reason for us to, there's no reason for us not to go ahead and do caching and other things to get this data faster to our users. All right, so with that said, we've gone ahead and generated everything you'll see here. And the difference though, is that now we'll see, if I go and open up this dist and we go ahead and look at index.home, I'm gonna go ahead and save this so it actually prettifies a little bit. Can I can can I prettier format document? There we go. Okay. When we look at the document this time, what you'll notice is that ULLI is completely blank. And if we think about this, actually, this makes sense because what have we done on the view side? We've defined that. Okay, when you're actually mounted, take JavaScript, and we're gonna do the thing to fetch it. So in other words, it has no idea what it has at the very beginning. So you're probably thinking now, okay, so if that's the case, how do we get it so that it actually renders the stuff out? And so this is where we start to get into more Nux territory uh, because this is now where they're gonna extend on this API to basically think this kind of stuff through. And so what the lifecycle hook I wanna teach you all with, to solve this particular problem is called async data. And the thing about working with Nux is that Nux actually has two different parts. And to show you what I mean, let's go ahead and take a look at the terminal again. When I start up my Yarn dev server, you'll notice two things. is that it's starting a client server as well as an actual server, right? Like the back end piece. And the reason for this is the client is certainly the, the front end as far as what we're typically used to working with. But there's actually a server piece to Nux that can allow us to do other things that basically like can get data ahead of time. And this is the key that we need when it comes to actually generating things upon build. Because we can't wait for the JavaScript to fetch it, we need to do that stuff in advance so that it can populate it correctly. And luckily, Nux makes this quite easy to do. So I'm gonna go ahead and just comment this out real quick. And we're gonna talk about the async data functionality. So async data as a lifecycle hook looks just like everything else that we've created from, an, from other lifecycle hooks, right? Created, mounted, it looks fairly straightforward. It is a function that will allow us to return certain things to the component. So to show you what I, for example, if I go ahead and let me, actually, let me go ahead and comment this out for a second. And let's go ahead and say uh, my async, let's see, I'll do this, my async data. First of all, this should break. Nothing, sh uh, there shouldn't be anything here. And by break, there's just nothing populated because it doesn't exist. But if we go ahead and from async data return uh, something called async, or uh, what, what did I call it? My async data. Yeah. So my async data, and I'm going to do, there we go. And if I save this, you'll see now that it's actually being populated correctly inside of our app. And so again, you're probably thinking, huh? Like, why, why would you do that? Like, why not put my async data directly inside of your data store as you would normally do for your app? 
And so the reason for this is, is, is key is, which is, is right inside of the lifecycle name, which is that we're looking for async data. In other words, the stuff that we're gonna do before uh, generation. And so let's go ahead now, and we're gonna take the stuff that we commented out originally, and we're gonna move it up into our async data up here. Now, the thing about async data though, actually, let me not jump to, let me just uncomment this here. And then let me add the async prefix here because we're doing an async call. So async await. And ooh, we have a question here. Kobe, what do you uh, got? <clears throat> just a question about async data. Are you able to use, so I know the data function or whatever isn't available in the composition API. So is async data available in the composition API slash, I don't think they're at view three yet, but are they at 2.6 with the, plugin are you able to, yeah. to do another thing for that so let me make sure i understand your question are you asking whether or not the composition api exists at this point with async no so right so setup or whatever is before data and computed and all that stuff so correct is async data before setup so that you can yep. get that information exactly so think of async data not as a client like it's not a lifecycle hook that exists within the view realm it is actually a lifecycle hook that exists, exists specifically in the Nux realm because it's doing something on the server side before passing it into the rest of the app. Like, that is the best way to think of it. So would you be able to access that through like uh, the context argument in setup or, or no? Yeah, so basically once you've exposed this data back to it, again, we can play around with this in just a moment, but I certainly believe that's the case. We will, again, we're here to experiment. So I yeah, will, let me, let me add, yeah, no, it's good. No, I like that. So again, let me add this here. Composition API Nux with async data. We are gonna test that out. I love the question. All right, we're gonna do that in just a moment. So thank you for that. We will check that out in a bit. Okay, so, Going on with this, if I save here and we go ahead and let it do its thing normally, you're going to notice that nothing's really changed uh, by nothing's really changed. Actually, I realized this is a false positive. I'm going to go ahead and uncomment this. Yep, we got an error. And why does this error exist? It actually, this is, this actually proves the point that Kobe was asking here, which is that async data exists before everything else does. So this whole, we want to do this.earthquake data equals response. This.earthquake data does not exist at this point. In fact, it doesn't exist till much later. So this whole thing is actually quite moot. And what we want to do instead, to be honest, is probably just go, let me do this comma earthquake data, right? And then we're going to have the response be this thing. And so now if I do it like this and save, we should see once I refresh, Boom, everything now is appearing as we expect. Now to prove that this actually works as we think it should, let's go ahead and turn off the server and let's go ahead and generate our build artifacts to see what exactly is going on. So it's gonna build the chunks and then it's processing everything. The server will go out, grab all the fun stuff and then let's take a look. So if we check at index.html this time, we notice something very different if my if I'm correct. Oh, wait. Oh, it has the old one open. I was gonna say, how's it already formatted? Woo, made me panic for a second. I was like, oh no, everything doesn't work as expected. Here we go. Here we go. You see this? Here's our H1 for hello July DC. Here's our async data that was automatically populated. And here is our entire list of earthquakes by ID. And now we have it. We have it ready for us at generation. And like I said, there are things we can certainly do on the, in terms of sprinkling in JavaScript to make sure that we check to make sure the last time this was fetched, if it's been more than a week, I'm sure we can define business logic to do that. But all of a sudden now you actually have hard coded things that are being generated statically that you can deploy to users. And I think it's, it's worth taking a moment to appreciate the simplicity that the Nux team like created as far as development goes. Because if we think of this, other than learning that async data exists and that basically like it exists outside and is like the very first thing you do, this actually feels like a normal view application development workflow. You really haven't done anything different. It's just the thing you would have done in async mounted is now done at async data. And more importantly, then you just return the data that you want rather than just expecting like the data store to be available at this time. So I wanna pause here real quick. What does anyone have any questions about what I've gone through so far?
Okay. Remember, there is always. Oh wait, I do see. Okay, Kobe, I'm assuming your hand is raised from the previous time. If not, let me know. But okay. So from here, no, 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 you're totally good. I just wanted to double check to make sure I didn't miss anything. From here, I think now let's go ahead and experiment on top of this. So we were just like, Kobe had this great question about composition API and how that plays into it. And oh, Aiden, Aiden has a question. Go ahead, Aiden, what do you got? Oh, wait, shoot, I realized, hold on, a lot of talk. Okay, now you should be good, sorry about that. Hey, Ben. So I, I just wanted to jump in a little question here in the Q&A section. I, so I'm coming from a React and I was just wondering what the difference is between Next and Next. Um, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with the concept in Next about the get service and props. So I understand it can be like a hybrid and do both in one app. Mm -hmm. uh, this what I've been struggling to conceptual conceptualize is Next like either one or the other with the setup when you run create nux app i i'm starting to understand it more but it's mm -hmm. still not 100 percent there you know okay let me start by addressing the first part of your question and if i miss anything let me know and so to restate the first part of your question i think is that you mentioned that you're from a react background and you've used next.js and so for those who don't know, so Next.js is the sort of the React equivalent of our Nuxt. So built a meta framework, built upon React to allow things like the static site generation we're actually talking about here today and making that possible within the React ecosystem. And so for those that have used Next before, or more importantly, for those who haven't used Next before, one of the things that Next does to try to do achieve a similar effect with our async data is they have things like get static props or get server side props. And what they're basically saying is similarly, like on the server side, do these things and then make it available to the application. One of the things, Aiden, I think in this particular regard, I think Nux, the Nux team has made this, in my opinion, simpler in the sense that, especially when it comes to the reactivity engine, the fact that we can just do this all in one place and then expose them as we want, there's no, there's no reason on our end to necessarily have the props change. The async data can receive the context so we still have access to different build modules and middleware. But then from here, like if we had another component here, call it we had a My Earthquake component, like we could still pass everything down as props. It's just not, at this point, we're really just passing data. So if it's like Earthquake data, um, actually I realized it's probably should be like this. And then we call it like Earthquake. You still get the same effects in this regard. Whereas in React, I know, because we're having worked with Next before, once you get the static props, you have to pass the static props into the component. And with Vue's reactivity system, because it's exposed within a more of a data store model, you don't really have to worry about all that configuration. It's basically made available for you. So hopefully that answers uh, that particular question when it comes to the between the two, as far as this approach. Once, you once you're in the async data, you do all the server side stuff, and then basically you expose it to your component or page, however you want, and then go from there. Although I should actually just clarify, async data in this particular thing, I realize we should clarify here with Nuxt, is that we've talked a lot about async, we talked a lot about async data, but the key thing to understand here is actually that we're, we're using it inside of the pages directory. Because while in a typical Vue CLI app, you have dot .view components and we superficially call them pages, like we'll separate them out via folder to claim that one dot .view file is different from another one. In the Nux ecosystem, there actually is a difference. And if, and if you think about it, it makes sense because when you say that it's a page, you're saying that it's a route automatically. So it automatically has that attachment to it. And as a result, this means that you get specific features catered to that. And so this async data route that we're talking about or async data lifecycle hook is specific to pages. Because if you think about it another way, you want the server to run this thing before generating the page. You don't necessarily want the thing to run before generating the component, for example. And so this is like at the page level because this is, think of it like a state management piece. 
And so everything else in component has a different async method actually called async fetch, which we may or may not get to. But honestly, if there's one thing I think most people need to learn, it's just that within the pages, use async data and you'll be able to get everything before your static generation period and then actually serve that stuff up right up to your user. A lot Good. of the stuff you are saying is helping clarifying this. I'm still on the journey to understand you and that's a lot more. Mm -hmm. I do agree some of the APIs are a lot nicer. That's probably why I'm sticking with it. <laughs> um, but so I possibly don't understand Next as much as I thought I did. You know, mm -hmm. like I would just understand it. So what I really struggle trying to conceptualize is okay, so I can do the static thing and get all the data data on the service server side rendering today and how that kind of works as well. Yeah, I don't think we'll probably talk specifically about server-side rendering because in my experience, traditionally, when people are looking for server-side rendering, they're usually looking for like the ability to call it basically shorten build times because let's say you have an e-commerce store that has 10,000 items. It probably doesn't make sense for you to build all 10,000 items every single time that you basically run a, a deployment. Because mostly you probably have like your first hundred or few hundred pages that are really key. But then after that, you want the ability to then generate those pages on demand. I think this is where a lot of people reach for SSR. But as a lot of the sort of technologies right now are starting to improve on their ability to provide better caching. And with Netlify, we have this concept of on-demand builders that's basically being developed as time goes on. It allows you to do things exactly as I say, where you use Jamstack type generation. So statically generating the core pages that matter to you and then using techniques such as on-demand builders to then generate those pages on the fly. But the benefit of this is that you don't have to have a server that's just sitting and waiting for things. It'll only, be, it'll be called basically with the serverless function. And that's what will generate your page at build time, like basically on request. And then it will be cached for everyone else going forward. And so this is something that's still in development, but I'm really excited about this particular technique because I think this is going to be solving that problem where that most people tend to reach for, uh, that most people tend to encounter when they're like, oh, I need SSR. But when in truth, you probably need something more of a hybrid approach that I just discussed. For kind of clarifying a bit more, um, yeah. I, I don't want to hold up the rest of <laughs> today because uh, I'm still fairly quite coding and specifically mixed nuts. It's been like a week. That's impressive. I've still got a lot and, you know, maybe I can reach out to you and if we can have a conversation about it sometime if you're free or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Let's find some time to sync up on this. I know that it can be a lot to take in. And so this is why we are approaching this kind of from the ground up. And then this way, as people have questions, I'll uh, definitely keep asking. But again, appreciate the questions that you've had so far, Aiden. Okay. Thanks so much, Ben. Yeah. I look forward to the rest of it. All, All right. right. Sounds good. All right. So now that we have basically... We've done the part where we've, we've managed the async data. We've proven that we can generate things. Let's go in for something a little bit more complex. We're going to talk about composition API and how it works within this context. And so let's go ahead and start by, first of all, your first question is probably, wait a second, Ben, aren't you using Nux2, which uses Vue2? And yes, you're right. And if you're thinking, well, composition API is in Vue3, so how, how is this going to work? Well, in case you didn't know, Composition API actually has a plugin for Vue 2. And so naturally, when someone managed to bring the Composition API into Vue 2, someone found a way to bring it into Nuxt. Aiden, I see you're raising your hand a couple of times. Is that intent? Do you have a question? Oh, sorry. I'm trying to put my hand down. No, it's all good. I just wanted to double check. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah. No worries. All right. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to install this composition API plugin into 
I realized, why am I even typing this? I'm just going to copy this. All right, we're going to install this into our Nuxt app. And so what this does is it think of the plugin as a polyfill backwards um, to allow us that kind of composition API like syntax within the view to uh, ecosystem. So I'll go ahead and I think, do I need to turn anything on? Let me double check. Key features, API, quick start. Oh, enable the build module. That is important. Okay. So now that we've talked about a, about a different things, we haven't covered too many specific things, but just like we have a view config.js, you shouldn't be too surprised to realize that we also have a Nux config.js, which allows us to define a lot of various things. So inside of here, there are a lot of various things in terms of defining global CSS, build modules, et cetera. Because after all, we now have a full blown meta framework sitting on top of view. There's quite a bit in there. But for now, what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and bring over our composition API module as defined here inside of our piece here. But what we'll notice here is that already I see here, there is an issue with static site generation async functions, which means you'll need to add time between pages being generated to allow any async functions to resolve. For now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually leave this alone. I'm not going to touch this because I want to see, let's see together what happens without this. So we're going to go ahead and close this and I'm going to go ahead and now start my server. Because again, for the, for those who are newer to this, like we're talking like this part is basically dealing with the build section. This really shouldn't impact our local development at this time. So I'm going to go ahead once again and oh, I have my local host 3000 right here. Great. Okay. So to give a quick crash course on composition API for those who are new to it here, basically, um, what we're used to doing within view is like our options API. So we have our data, we have things like computed, and we have these very predefined places where pieces of our app go. And so composition API basically takes that idea and says, what if you can organize it however you want? You're not constricted where you put data and what you put methods on. And so instead what we have here now, which is built in by default in uh, view three is the setup function. And so what setup does actually, it acts a lot like the data function in that it's a, it's a function that returns a data that will be exposed to set component. So to show you what I mean, I'll say const count equals, I'll say 10, and then we'll return the count back to the component. And so I'll just save this. And so nothing should happen, right? Because we have actually haven't exposed it. So I'll go up into my HTML and then under my H1, this is where I'll say count and we'll expose it here. And when I save, we should see, there you go, our account has showed up. And so to show you a little bit more of how the composition now API works in this regard, we can now say if we want to actually then import, we want to make like count reactive, for example, we would then go ahead and this is where we would basically import methods that help us define that something is reactive. So here, let me go ahead and make sure I know the do how they import the API. So already I'm already seeing some things that we're going to need to check out. Dun, 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 use route, quick gotchas. Actually, I believe now if I import from, let's see. So it was view, next. Yeah. Okay. So import from this package, we're going to import this reactive property. And so actually I'm just going to take ref and we're going to make this a reference outside of setup. Oh, Kobe is totally right. We need to import this stuff up here. So what I've done here is I've imported a helper method that allows me to define a reactive property um, in here. And so if everything is fine, nothing should break right now. And we should still see 10. And the difference now is we're going to also define a method for increasing the count. And so this here is where I'm going to define a method, right? This is where we typically would say a method, but it's just a function. And this function will take uh, count dot value plus plus. And the reason for the dot value is that ref, again, I'm not going to dive into it, but basically it, it uses the proxy version of uh, proxy type of JavaScript to help with the reactivity. And so let me just show you how this works though, before we uh, get into the nitty gritty. So we have increased count that is going to be exposed back to the component. And now in here, inside of our button, I'm just going to have a button that says increment. And then we're going to say that when we at click it, we're going to increment count. And so now to show you this works, when we click did not sadness count dot value, that should be it. 
increase. Oh, increase count. Ha. Yes. Thank you, Bill. Increase count. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, it didn't work. Hey, everything works. Wonderful. Okay. So this is working exactly as expected. The difference is the setup here, you'll notice looks a lot more like regular JavaScript because in essence setup is right. It's now normal JavaScript where we sprinkle in view, whereas the options API basically takes a more opinionated approach to how you write things. And then you get some, a little bit of magic when it comes to this context and that kind of thing. So some people really like the composition API. Some people there. So basically it's valid to use both. Um, and oh yes, Kobe, sorry, I just saw your question. This is a wrapper around the view composition API plugin. So the question here is how do we actually access this stuff inside that's been exposed? And so this leads me to believe though, that if we actually log, okay, if I remember correctly, you get props and you get context in setup. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna log context out inside of here. Cause I wanna see exactly what's being exposed. And so when we take a look at the console here, all right, so let me, can I blow this up a little bit? I can blow this up some more, excellent. Okay, here is our object with our context. And you know, the context gets quite a few things. It has the attributes that are given to the adders, and then it has things that are being emitted. It has servers, parents, listeners, view parent, the rest, and root and slots. Ooh, SSR context, that's not it. Okay, refs in here, doesn't look like this is it. So how do we get the context that we've exposed here? That is ultimately the question. So if we're doing this, my guess is we actually need some sort of, how do we get async data? Okay, hold on, what is this use async? I just saw something, bum, bum, bum. Use async. Pen on async data, let's see, define components, setup, use async, HTTP, get, nope. Oh, this is interesting. This will inline the helper, much like async data, it won't rerun these client calls from the async data side. Huh. So what this tells me is that they have actually gone ahead and said that async data no longer needs to sit outside of it. I guess that does make sense sense, um, unless you provide your own unique key, more information. So what I'm hearing here is that we can actually do this quite differently. All right. We're going to comment this out and we're going to, we're going to be importing the use async function to do this. And so use async. That's fine. I mean, so if I save this, everything should break and we see ha, everything breaks. Wonderful. That's what we wanted. So what they are saying is that if we look in here and we do cons earthquake data, and we're going to say, this is use async and inside of this async method, we're going to actually now move all. Yep. I'm just going to re return all of this. So I'm going to copy all that, cut all this and drop it in this function. I'm going to uncomment it. This will be a little bit too verbose at the moment. So let's go ahead and delete this piece and we're actually just going to return the response we're not because again my theory here is when we return the response that gets assigned to earthquake data and then here is where we actually can expose earthquake data right here so if we go ahead and save let's go ahead and let that return Woof. okay a couple of things things are a breaking and why this actually makes sense because we have an await here. So if we have an await, this means that we actually probably need to use the async keyword right here. And then, ho, oh, check that out. I think that worked. Looks like that worked correctly. And so props and context disappear. And what are features null? Features of null. Refresh. Okay, that was weird. Oh, it only runs once. I think that's what they were referring to. Okay. But what we've seen here is that even with a plugin, there already is starting to be a shift as far as the mentality, because what this, as far as like what I said at the beginning, as far as the Nux2 and the async data living outside of it, they're starting to think about possibly instead bringing in the async data function into the setup 
uh, context because this is happening before everything's happening as far as like builds and life cycle hooks. So why not combine the two? And I'm not going to lie. I actually really like this because what this ultimately tells us is that at the beginning of the component, when we're looking at this, we get the opportunity to define everything and compose it as we want. And then we can return it at the end for the rest of the component to use. And actually, if we look at this, this is pretty exciting. This is fairly other. So use async, basically uh, a Nux lifecycle hook. This works. So to make sure this actually works as we expect, though, let's go ahead and, oh, wait, did I have other properties I referenced in here that I should delete? Yeah, my async data doesn't exist anymore. So that's done. Okay, so what we're going to do here now is we're going to go ahead and build the page and see what it is exactly we get. Ah, this is a good question from Kobe. We're going to take, we're going to come back to that in just a moment. All right, so here we go. We have everything built and let's see exactly what happened here. I have, I have a hunch as far as what's going to happen, but we're going to find out together. All right, so I'm going to format the documents a little bit easier to read and Hey, check that out. It looks like everything is actually still being generated exactly as you expect. This is wonderful. Okay. So that's good. It does. However. Okay. So let me, let's be clear. We talked, this session is about experimenting with nuts. We're showing what's possible. And basically with this particular experiment, we're talking about what things might look like in the future. And so I think this is a good time before I get to Kobe's question here is that if you go to preview.nuxjs.org, y'all might not have heard about this. I'm going to drop this into the chat for everyone. And if you're looking for the username password, it is just nux slash nux, nux, sorry, nux for the username, nux for the password. But you'll see here that there is a little banner here for nux3, which is currently in private beta. So in other words, what we're here, what I'm here giving you a little bit of sneak peek into is that right now, Nux3 is actually very, very close to like, we starting to taste the, the reality of seeing a Nux3 in the wild. And so during August, 2021, there is a, they're hoping to have a public beta for those who are willing to test sort of their sea legs with Nux3. But then most importantly, for those looking for an actual stable production ready deployment that is still aimed for Q4. But this is exciting because for those of us who are looking to try it out and just learn and get familiar with it, honestly, in my experience, looking at what the team has built and the quality of work they typically do, honestly, even the public beta would be very reliable for a lot of call it like scaffolding work to get it up and running. And then certainly when it comes to the stable production, maybe a couple of things change, but then at that point, at least you've done most of the work up front. So I'm super, super excited about this public. Now that said, so. This means that this Nux Composition API thing we're talking about right here is really for people who are just looking to push the limit and just try to like really do Composition API within the Nux2 ecosystem. But given that Nux3 is so close, I would say that if you're using this for clients, it might honestly not, it, like basically what I'm saying is it might not really be worth it to try to convert a bunch of stuff to Composition API in Nux2 right now, given that Nux3 is really quite close on the horizon. But again, it's nice to play around with for side projects and stuff. But as you can see, there are like, they have a whole section dedicated to gotchas, right? As far as what happens to uh, server-side rendering and how that impact. This is one of those use the plugin with caution kind of things. But it's very cool that even with just, again, I walked into this with, I haven't played with the plugin regarding this particular context. And if you can see with fairly like basically low barrier of entry, we actually managed to get everything working as exactly as we want, which is very cool. Now, Kobe here has an excellent question, which is this earthquake data, is it something that's actually reactive? That is the question here. And so if we take a look at earthquake data here, let's go ahead and open up. Uh, wait, I realized I actually kicked off the local dev server, so that's no longer running. Let's go ahead and see exactly what, how it's been exposed, and then let's, let's try to modify it. So localhost 3000. We have everything in here, which is great. And let's go and take a look at the view dev tools and inside of Nux. We have, I always click the wrong one, pages index. Here we go. So we have our earthquake data. This is great and features, this looks good. And so the question is, is this something that we could basically reactively change? And so I think the easiest way to check this out, honestly, is to let's modify Bbox. Let's do that. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna move this over to the third and then let me close this. 
And let's change this up a little bit. Let's switch it up from features to Bbox. And Bbox, I think no longer has an ID though, because it's basically just this. So I'm gonna take out, so this is basically an array of numbers. So I'm gonna take the index here and I'm gonna hack together a key, which I don't typically recommend and just call it like Bbox index. So this way it has a unique identifier and, and view will not be mad. And then we can basically, again, I'll just call this Bbox. I'll call it box so that we don't get confused. And this will be box as well. And when we save this, we should get, as expected, the individual coordinates, which is great. But now we want to modify said coordinates. So just to continue the experiment of composition API, let's say that we have a button where we want to add new coordinate. Okay. And we're going to be, we're going to, so we want a function that's called add new coordinate. And so I'm going to save that and it should yell at me because it'll say, Hey, I don't, uh, beatbox of null. Can I refresh? Okay. There we go. Add new coordinate. And then if I click on this, nothing's going to happen. Why? Because we haven't created it yet. So to show that it actually works, we're going to go ahead in here and we'll say const add new coordinate is a function. And to show you it works to start, we're going to go ahead and log out the fact that add new coordinate. And we're going to go ahead and expose that to the component and save. And so already I can see some of the, the weird async stuff. Basically, every time it tries to reload, it only fetches the first time, which is why the hot module replacement is breaking. So if you're wondering why that's happening, that is, I'm pretty sure that's the reason. So as you can see here, when we click, wonderful, we see add new coordinate. So now the question is, can we modify it? So if, it, if earthquake data is a ref, what we should find is that, again, I'm gonna leave the console log just to make sure everything works, is that when we do earthquake data dot value dot B box, we should be able to push, I'm gonna push a new one for, I'm gonna push a new value called 88.5. And I'm gonna save. Okay, if this works, this will be great. Oh, it works. <laughs> Fantastic. So we have discovered by, without, I was going to say trial and error, but really it was trial and success, is that earthquake data by default, they've decided when creating this API, once again, this is where I really applaud the next team and the, the level of detail they, they think of when they do this, is that they're saying that when you, by the point you've taken the effort to bring async data in, this is something you're going to want to watch. Let's make it reactive. Let's not make you wrap it in a second thing that makes it something that you have to track and change. And this is wonderful. So what does this mean? This means also now we get to do things like, let's say I want to add a property that's called coordinate input. And again, I'll just make that fit 46 for now. Uh, so coordinate input, and I'll show you what, what I'm doing with this real quick. Coordinate input is here. So I exposed it. And then I'm going to put an input here with a, which is a type of number and the V model of coordinate input. So if this works as I expect and refresh, we'll see here that coordinate input is here. And actually to show you that it actually works, we're going to say coordinate input. I always getting, I always like finding ways to make my feedback loop as quickly as possible. And it's, it's just so fast. Okay. Look, this is great. We've added it. And so now that we have this, we have the V model attached. This should now work correctly in terms of now saying, instead of just saying coordinate input, like pushing just this random thing. We can now say coordinate input. That's it. Although this is fascinating to me because I just realized coordinate input is technically not a reactive property. And this is funny to me. Ha! This is an interesting discovery because you can see here that the V model is actually updating correctly. But every time I add a new coordinate, it's actually fixed at the cons. This is programmatically correct. This is actually what we we should be expecting because like I said, we never made this reactive. So it's funny that the call it, however they're doing like the, the reactivity watching, it's funny that it's separated. So to make sure this um, works as expected, let me just turn this into a ref. And then again, I'll save this to show you for those who are newer to composition API that this is not exactly gonna work as expected. Because when we push it, you'll see that it's doing this weird object thing. And this is what I was talking about. When you're using a ref, all right, think of it as a reference, a reactive reference. You have this thing where you need to unpackage it every time. And so this is one of the 
at least in the current iteration of composition API, this is what I would consider a downside to using ref. It's because that the forcing people to unwrap things by dot value is a little bit awkward. And so we'll show you a little bit of how another way we could do that just in a moment. But now if I do dot value instead, we'll see that if I go ahead and do one, two, three, boom, one, two, three. If I do 86.5438, everything works. Then now everything works exactly as you expect which is super exciting, honestly. It's cool to see that it, it is really working together this seamlessly. And again, we, have, we aren't even using the Vue 3 reactivity engine and all the performance optimizations we get with that, which is absolutely great. And so now that we have this, I did, I, I did tease like how else we can do this for those who are like, oh, like this ref thing's a little bit weird. Yeah, I think so too. So if instead what we wanted to do is call it focus more on like a data store model, my preference at this point with this particular iteration of uh, composition API, and I say that very specifically because there are some tooling being developed that might actually make this a lot easier in the, in the near future, is that instead of just having a ref, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, I'm gonna call this cons, I'm gonna say data store, just so that it's a little bit more familiar to people. And this is a reactive object. Right, so it's a reactive function that takes uh, that will turn this object into something that's reactive. And what do I mean by that? Instead of count ref ten, it's just count ten. And then when it comes to actually exposing this, right, we will expose instead of count, we'll do data store. And then I can save that. And so that that's going to break. That makes sense for no reason. But I'm going to do data store dot count. If I save this and refresh, ref is not defined. Oh, other things are using ref right now. I can't take it away just yet. Uh, so that's just for the one section. Refresh. Okay. So here we go. You'll see that right now, data store.count is here and we have a count here. And here we have data store count. And what's great about the reactive helper method, which I really like, is because to me, this is much more similar to what we're used to with the options API, is that now rather than taking increment count here and doing count.value, we just say, data store dot count plus plus. This is how you would typically expect to actually write your code in a normal like view is where you, you say, take this reactive property that I want and then just change it. I don't have to unpack it and do the things. And I, and I love that. And so here actually, even in our live coding demo here, you see a little bit of the downside with composition API. And I say downside more that it is a double-edged sword. In what exactly? In the fact that our code can be written however we want now. And so if you notice, this const earthquake data here is very awkwardly placed. It really has nothing to do with each other. So really what we probably wanna do honestly is organize this so that these stores are together and then let's group earthquake data down here and then coordinate inputs gonna be here. That's fine, these are grouped. But now all of a sudden, which is, and it, again, this is as much of a, can be as much of a benefit as it can be a detriment depending, is that your team is now very much responsible for how things are organized and whether they make sense. I know a lot of people did complain about like when options API, when it's super long, it's weird to organize things in a way that made sense. I do understand that was one of the downsides, but I think it's, it's hard to argue against the fact that the beautiful thing about the options API is that no matter who walked into the code base, they knew where to start looking for things. They didn't have to worry that like things would be architected in a very opinionated way by the programmer. This is also the benefit of things like Vuex, right? Like when you have specific patterns that are consistent, this is very beneficial, especially at enterprise um, application levels where you don't know who is going to be walking into your code base. So the last thing you want is someone like refactoring it in their specific flavor and like you completely losing context of everything. Again, freedom is good. Just make sure that you use it responsibly. <laughs> okay. That said, we've talked a little bit here now about the various things and we've, and with that, actually, we've gone ahead and shown one of, we've shown composition API with this earthquake data. So actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to commit this stuff real quick. Feature at composition API with earthquake data. Perfect. All right. And so for those wondering though, okay, this is great. And what like the one thing I do want to cover, I think in the next five minutes before we can leave it to final questions and wrap wrapping up for the day is what about Vuex? Because typically you'd have to install the module, you'd have to set up stores and stuff. How does that exactly work within the next context? I guess 
remember how I told you like routing's a lot easier because of things like pages? You might have noticed that inside of here, we have a store folder. And so this basically means that everything in Vuex is ready for you to go should you choose to use it. And so in this particular case, if I went ahead and created an earthquake.js store, this is where we're going to get a chance to basically create our store. So what I'm going to do is Nux Vuex real quick so that we can get like a boilerplate. And so you'll see here, I'm going to go ahead and just copy this over. Let's get that boilerplate. All right, we have the exported con state mutations. Okay, so actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm not even gonna do the counter one. First, let me, do, let me just call this counter.js. Okay, so the cool thing about this now is that you'll see that counter, again, I'm gonna actually make this the state here as 10, and then we have this state.counter, great. And so now that we have this store, this store for counter with a state and a mutation, we can come in here and we can say, okay, inside of my script, I'm going to import, I actually realize I don't even need to import anything. I am going to, let me hide the setup stuff real quick. And we're going to, whoa, what happened there? That was a weird thing. Inside of our computer, yes. Inside of our computer properties, I'm going to say counter or current count. And what I'm going to do is this return this dot store dot counter dot count. And then to show you that this works, I'm going to go ahead and switch current count, data store dot count with current count. And actually I realized this probably won't look appear to be any different because I made it 10. Let's make it a hundred. Okay. So now if I refresh, oh, I <laughs> stopped the server again. Womp womp. I was wondering why nothing was happening. Bum, bum, and we build, and it's great. Uh, count of undefined, where did I, I think I messed up the syntax. Da -dun -dun. Nux view X, where's my Nux view X? Nux view X store directory, give me a quick sec. Yep, it'll be created. And then increment plugins, how do I call it? I believe it was this dot store. Let me just check something real quick. Dun, 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 dun. Refresh. Oh, circular. Okay, hold on one sec. I do know that I can at least check it this way. That didn't like it. Oh, what happened to my website? Okay, much better. Okay, so if we go inside of our view application and look at the view X, this is where we'll see that counter actually does exist and it's at 10. It's just for whatever reason, I am touching the syntax for get state. So let me, no, I don't want to get her. I literally just want state. Store.state. Yup. Oh, do I, what did I mess up? What did I mess up? Bum, 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 bum. Yep, I was right. It is a computer property because we are returning current count. Yeah, I was right. Store.state.count. All right, maybe it's state.count and then maybe I just messed it up. State.count, current count. Oh, return. Turn, save, fresh. No, store dot counter this should that state that count it doesn't like it okay hang on i am gonna figure this out because this is bothering me map state I, I so i know that i have map state but i it should be this simple a state dot count nux view x get state Store directory Vuex store. Yeah. Try a getter. So that is a, so yeah. So what Larry is suggesting here is that inside of here, we can basically define a getter to access the state. So typically when you do getters there, there are things like call it double count where you get the state and then you can return 
basically state counter times two. So something like this. Actually, when you want to access the state like itself, you actually don't need to do things like, so some people would do something like this, return state.count. Oh, <laughs> it's called counter. Oh my gosh. Okay. Please wait. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Counter store state refresh. Yep, there we go. State dot counter dot counter and refresh. There we go. Oh gosh, that was that is ugly. And that is ugly for so many reasons. Let me one rename this to count. And this is now count. Okay, much better. And then to show you this actually worked when I switch this to 200 and we save this now updates now to 200. Okay, <laughs> excellent. So you can see here, one of the nice thing about this is that normally with Vuex, it kind of assumes you have a global store, but because it's basically already considered like a best practice, stores are really supposed to be broken out into name, the mo namespace modules so that we can do things like counter.js and we can do things like doing, for so example, if I want to create a store specifically for earthquake data, I can have an earthquake.js. So earlier um, using this template before, there's nothing stopping us from saying, so here, I'm just going to do bbox, which is an empty array. And then I'll say the set bbox here and state bbox equals, oh, I think it was like payload. There's nothing stopping us from creating global state that we can share amongst our applications. And it's all done again with zero conflict. It's just available for you. So to show you the difference is I'm going to say that in this particular state, let me do one, two, three for our bbox for our state. And so inside of our index.view, we end up getting here is if I say new bbox, I can return this.store. I can go specifically to the earthquake store. Sorry, I can go specifically to the earthquake state, and then I can get bbox like this. And so if I save, nothing should appear yet. Because again, once again, we're still running to that async data thing for composition API. But I can do, I can show you that this works here in that current bbox is just like, I call it current bbox, or I did new, new bbox. Man, naming, so tricky, new bbox. There you go. Now that we have our list. And so just to demonstrate the final piece as far as what Larry was saying here regarding getters, when you're using things in Vuex, so this goes for just not only Nux, this is just like a Vuex tip in general. When you need to access the state, just access the state directly. On the hand that we want to go ahead and run a computed like property on the state that we want, we know that it's going to be reused. And so that's the key part to where getters come in is that you have a piece of a state that's going to be computed and reused. If it's just going to be computed in one place, it's debatable whether you really want that like taking up space in your global store. And so in the particular case of, let's say, Earthquake.js, let's say we wanted a, a point where we wanted to double or let's triple all the bbox coordinates. So we would basically set a getters, which basically it's an interesting name, but really think of it as computed. Don't think of it as getters. So I'll call this as triple bbox equals, and then I'll say, so it's going to get the state. And then inside of the state, we basically define, a, basically, we're going to say return state.bbox, and then I'm going to map it. And for every item, it already knew the AI had predicted it already, but I don't return this. And so there we go. Now that we've exposed it here, I'm going to go ahead and end on this particular note, but we'll notice that inside the Vuex within namespace, you'll see triple, triple box is uh, triple B box exists now with 369 exactly as you want. And now it's globally available. Okay, with that, I'm going to go ahead and save this for everyone. So let's go ahead and so feature add Vuex store demo. And then let me go ahead and repo and create this thing real quick. Public, yes, everything's great. And then push origin main. Awesome. And then let me go ahead and drop this inside the chat for everyone. And with that, we have, we basically have completed a circuit around Nux as far as getting started. 
and really starting to understand that really the, the question to probably like the first question you might think of is when should I use Nux and when should I use Vue? To be honest, if you're building a website that has any sort of like, I don't know, basically like client interaction in the end where you have multiple pages and things, it's hard to, to say, basically use Nux, to be honest. It does so much out the gate for you. We haven't even talked about setting meta ties and all those other things. A lot of the great modules that they have that makes Nux really a phenomenal developer experience to use. Because once again, like you don't have to feel like you're picking between like your favorite child or anything. Like Nux is still using Vue. So the nice thing about the Vue CLI certainly and using Vue is that if you're wanting to ship like small single page applications, this is still, I, I would still say that in that case, maybe you might want to use a Vue CLI or more importantly, if you're looking for progressive enhancement. So your client or your customer is not ready for a full-blown migration because Nux owns everything, right? As we saw, it does everything from the uh, development server all the way to the generation part. And if you're not quite ready for that, because maybe you're on a rail server and you're trying to slowly move towards Vue. In that particular case, I would say use Vue as a CDN in that, in, that in that case. But more importantly, in case you hadn't heard of it yet, it's not completely like production ready, but Petite Vue is something that Evan came out with fairly recently, actually. And once again, I'll drop this in the chat. And the reason this is very interesting is because it is a five kilobyte subset of Vue that's basically designed for this exact purpose. And so it takes a lot of what's great about Vue, allows you to sprinkle it on top of an existing DOM and do its magic. And that to me, um, again, super, super exciting for allowing people to progressively enhance their websites and applications. Okay, so I think we're coming to time, but I'd love to check, does anyone here have any questions that they'd like to ask regarding Nuxt? Yeah, so give a couple, give a little bit to see anyone here, some questions. Oh, I see Bill. All right, Bill, I'm gonna allow you to talk. If you'd rather just chat though, just leave you muted and more than welcome to just type it. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, how's it going, Bill? Good, how are you? Doing good. But, um, I guess you were, when you were doing the UX thing, that was you were using the modules mode versus the classic mode, is that right? Yeah, so it's like the namespace module mode. And so they basically, we'll see here um, inside the UX docs, modules. Basically, rather than having all of the states share the same spot, we allow us to namespace it accordingly. And, and Nux does this for you automatically at the bat. So is that kind of best practice to use the modules mode as opposed yeah. to the classic putting all in one file? Exactly, because what you want to try to get the developers kind of thinking along the lines of is like how to really split the scope of responsibility as small as possible, because then you actually have a chance for call it like code splitting in the future and that kind of stuff. Whereas in applications I've seen where they've only stuck to global namespace, eventually it becomes like this giant mess of things. And then when they're looking at performance, they're like, why does our, why does our global store have 10,000 items in there? It doesn't need it in this context. And so yeah, it's considered basically best practice to use the uh, modules when using Vuex, even if it's a small, it, it's better to just start that way rather than go have a giant store and then refactor it out later. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. And so does this, does Next work with something like Beautify for styling as well? Yeah, so one of the things that Nux does really well that we haven't talked about as well is they have a ton of modules. And when I say modules, they're basically like these plugins to supercharge things. So as you just talked about like things like Beautify, they have these modules that integrate directly in so that you get all the benefits of the Nux ecosystem in combination with those plugins that you're probably used to using within the Vue CLI. And so they even have integrations for things like, as we can see, Shopify, if you have your head contentful, like a lot of the, once you get, I think, to the integrations piece, there's a lot that's done on the Nux front, which um, I think a lot of people would really enjoy using. Does that help to answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, Isaac, for coming. Appreciate it. Cool. I think with that, Bill, do you have another question, Bill? I didn't, no. Nah. Okay, no problem. Yeah, I think with that, we can close for a today's... Oh, Aiden, Aiden has a question. Aiden, what's on your mind? Sorry, I was muted there. Um, no, it's fine. Just quickly, I wanted to ask. So 
I know you briefly mentioned, I think, about the DPR, which is a newer feature coming out of how Is there something like that with next that gradually tying in, talking to me about briefly before? And yeah. how does that all work with hydration and stuff, you know, to stop content from getting stale? I was just wondering if you could you know, shed more light on that. You mentioned sort of we're going down that route before. Sure. So to restate your question, basically you're asking me to talk a little bit more about this sort of hybrid deployment approach that I mentioned earlier regarding my, I did on-demand builders, which I'll refer to as ODB. And Aiden, you'd mentioned DPR, which for those who don't know, stands for distributed persistent rendering, which is an architectural pattern that Netlify has kind of like presented as a way to solve uh, sort of the hybrid rendering. And so on the next JS side in particular, there there are have been some solutions around this. And so the popular one that um, was pushed by Vercel is known as incremental static regeneration. And so in this regard, I think uh, that, and that has been primarily talked about within the next ecosystem, although I've, I've heard they're, they're looking to find ways to expand that. But from the Netlify side, which I can speak to more as an expert, is that on-demand builders and distributed persistent rendering is supposed to be a framework agnostic approach. And so I know that we are trying to work closely with the next team to ensure that basically going forward without going too deep into it is that what you would have is you'd have a series of components that, or pages that you can request and you'll basically point serverless functions at them so that when the time comes that it, let's say Nux, or sorry, when, ne when your site receives a request that matches a certain pattern to hit a serverless function, if the page does not already exist, it'll go ahead and run that serverless function to work with Nux to make sure everything's built out correctly and that everything is hydrated um, at the right time. And the second part of your question regarding like stale data is that one of the beautiful things about, I think this hybrid approach is that when you have the ability to sprinkle in still, because again, we're doing static generation to cache that response so that people get basically, if they're requesting the same thing, they get, there's no reason to run that computation over and over. But with the ability to sprinkle in Nuxt and have that dynamically update, basically enhance those pieces, you obviously can still run those checks in the event that like something changes. But more importantly, a big philosophy of Netlify is that all your deployments are atomic. Because one of the trickiest things about caching is that if done incorrectly, what you might end up happening is that the pages you've cached versus what you deploy later on are going to be disjointed. And as some of you, or a lot of you probably have experienced in your careers, is that one of the worst kind of bugs you can get is when a customer is going, I'm experiencing these errors. And when you try to reproduce it, it's nowhere to be found. And we always hope that it's not because the customer has something cached that we cannot see on our end. And this is probably one of the biggest dangers and gotchas when it comes to um, approaching cache because everyone likes to just say, oh, just cache everything. But we have to be very careful of what happens when you get inconsistent state, right? Like predictable state that we can count on over a period of time is much, um, I would argue more important than having the performance of cache and then realizing later that you have basically disjointed state. And especially when Next3 comes out and as we do more with on-demand builders, you'll see a lot more resources coming from the Netlify DX team as far as like guidance on how to take what we already know here. Because our goal with Netlify, especially in particular, is to make it as easy as possible for you to focus on the problems you care about, which is solving business needs. Things as far as like making sure things are deployed in an atomic way so that they're basically sectioned out and replaced correctly and allowing you to do all the caching and stuff without you thinking about it, just like Vue, how Vue takes care of things so that we don't have to worry about, did the reactivity work? Like we know, we trust that Vue takes care of it. Netlify tries to do the same exact model with this kind of stuff that we all have to deal with when it comes to serving our applications to customers. But yeah, so Aiden, be on standby, I'm sure. Uh, we will, we will be sharing a lot more about how to do that. I imagine I'll have a whole talk on taking Nux to that next level of hybrid rendering with distributed persistent rendering and ODB in the near future. So hope that gives you some context to your question. All right, with that, I think we're over time, but thanks again, everyone for joining tonight. I know that it was a little bit of a late notice for this particular meetup, but as far as next events, uh, next month, we actually have, uh, someone speaking from the prominent member of the Vue community will be speaking to us about using state machines with writing better components. So I'm super excited because state machines are a topic I've heard a lot about and would love to see people learn more about that. 
And finally, if you're looking for conferences, I think View London, View Amsterdam, and View Toronto are all happening this year. If any of those places sound interesting to you, be sure to check out those websites. We'll try to make sure to have the websites for you next time. But I believe View Toronto will be remote. It'll be in November. And then I believe View London will be hybrid remote with in-person and View Amsterdam may be full that uh, as well as hybrid. But if you want to attend either of those in person and you're willing to travel, I think that is an option for you. They are doing partially in person. Anyhow, all right. With that, thank you everyone for joining tonight. And with that, yeah, good night, everyone.